It is now 5.30. This is the meeting for the Colton Joint Unified School District Board of Education. Today is Thursday, February 3rd, 2022. I'm going to start with a roll call of the board members. Ms. Medina, can you please do the roll call? Mr. Ibarra? Present. Mrs. Haro? Present. Mr. Flores? Present. Ms. Thori Nojeda? Mrs. Sandoval? Present. Mr. Fuentes? Present. Mrs. Adigate? Present. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. We're going to begin today's meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to ask our communication specialist, Lynette White, to lead us in the flag salute. Thank you, Lynette. We do have an interpreter present who is available for Spanish speaking persons who need assistance, uh, Ms. Cynthia Bueno. Thank you, Mrs. Flores. Uh, muy buenas tardes a todos. Uh, yo me llamo Cintia Bueno, soy intérprete y traductora del distrito. Esta noche podré proporcionar servicios de interpretación si alguien lo desea. Tengo los dispositivos que pueden utilizar para escuchar toda la reunión en español, si gustan. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Item 1.3, adoption of the February 3rd, 2022 agenda. I would like to uh, ask for a motion to adopt the agenda with the following amendments. Amend closed session item 9.4, personnel public employee, appointment discipline dismissal release, the addition of one classified coach, a head varsity cross country co-ed, addition of two volunteer coaches, track co-ed, softball girls, uh, which was previously, we had one. Okay, I need a motion. Okay. Thank you. Second. Okay. Ms. Sandoval. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays? Okay. Okay. On motion by board member Fuentes and board member Sandoval, the board adopted the agenda as recommended. Moving on to 2.1, we have one of our high schools. We have Bloomington High School doing our present, their presentation today. And I would like to ask Ms. Roman to come up and introduce our students. Thank you, Board President Adekin, members of the board, and Superintendent Dr. Miranda. It is my pleasure to uh, um, introduce our two students here today who are going to be presenting on behalf of Bloomington High School, Samantha Figueroa and Angela Santana. Thank you. Good evening, Board Member Adegin, members of the school board, Superintendent Miranda, and members of the audience. My name is Samantha Figueroa, and I'm a student leader in my final year at Bloomington High School. Angela Santana joins me this evening to shine the spotlight on our Bruin family. We're honored to share about academics, athletics, and activities information for our Bruin country since our last visit. I'd like to begin by sharing some information about BHS academics. Our science department started a great tradition several years ago known as the pumpkin drop. The spirit of Halloween, physics students worked hard to make sure their pumpkin is able to survive a long drop from the roof of our Vivian Bish Auditorium. With limited resources, they use physics principles and creativity during what has now to come as known as the great smashing pumpkin drops, held each year on Halloween. Students enjoy the spectacle so much, teachers bring their classes out to see it. Soon after, our auditorium started going under extensive renovations, but that did not stop our semester two award ceremony for the 2020-21 school year. We finally had the opportunity to recognize students for the hard work at this ceremony. I was recorded for parents and loved ones to watch. This year, our performing arts program produced a musical review called All Together Now, a company they work with quite a bit called Music Theater International, 
provided schools and theaters around the globe with an exclusive musical review, featuring songs from MIT's beloved shows, all free of charge. It was designed this way on purpose to be used as a fundraiser for local theaters to perform live over the same four days from November 12th to 15th. Bloomington High School's choral and theater students performed their production on the 12th. The past months have been extremely challenging for theatrical organizations. So this show offered a way to welcome audiences back into person theater in support of thousands of theaters who are persevering under trying circumstances. It was a wonderful night to see our very talented Bruins take the stage to reignite theater and performance in a post-pandemic world under the direction of Mr. Ryan Duckworth and Mrs. Taylor Richardson. All together now lit up our stage and it was amazing to see Bruin performers back on the stage doing what they love. Before finals, our Link crew hosted Coco and Cram. This was an opportunity for students to study and socialize between intense studying to prepare for finals. The students were offered hot chocolate and cookies to enjoy while studying and helping one another prepare for the week. Our counseling department creates an environment of support for our students, especially through all the workshops and advisory meetings they host for Bruins. Recently, they assisted students with college application and filling out FAFSA. Students also had the opportunity to meet with many college advisors to make the transition to college easier. This week, our counselors held virtual visits with our middle schoolers to register them for next year classes. The video presentation information slideshow served as a tool to familiarize future Bruins with their pathways, specialty electives, like the visual and performing arts, NJROTC, and general course offerings. This is just one more thing that proves how wonderful and helpful our counseling department is. Very soon is our WASP mid-cycle review. This is where the rest and associate of schools and colleges visits our campus to see how we've been improving upon these recommendations given to us at our last campus visit. Teacher support staff, students, and parents have been working on our report and preparing evidence that shows how we have been addressing the recommendations. This visit is set for March 7th, so we are finishing up the final touches in preparation. Virtual Enterprise has been giving it their all on businesses. Both teams, E-Compact and Case of Armor, competed in Redlands and both placed in the top 42 teams. This accomplishment advanced them to the next round that normally takes place each year in Bakersfield. Unfortunately, these Bruins were unable to compete live, but that did not stop them from succeeding in virtual competitions. Both teams once again move up to next round to the top 16. In the recent competition, Case of Armor has advanced to the national realms. This means that B since BHS placed in the top eight, they move on to compete in New York. These students are now deciding, dedicating themselves to perfecting their 20-page business plan, practicing for another competition held February 24th and then on to nationals. Congratulations to our BHS virtual enterprise team. Thank you, and I will now pass this on to Angela for information on athletics and activities. Hello and good evening. My name is Angela Santana, a sophomore at Bloomington High School, and today I will be talking about our athletics programs and, act and activities. For our winter sports, we have boys and girls basketball, co-ed wrestling, and boys and girls soccer. In Bruin country, we always look forward to supporting our basketball teams. There is something about being in the gym with parents, students, and all supporters of BHS athletics and, and that ignites spirit. We're grateful for the opportunity to support the teams and to hear the spirited support from the stands. Our girls team is playing against Rim of the World tonight and our boys are awaiting new due dates due to postponement. Our wrestling program has been working hard to rebuild its team. Not only is it their first year competing in Division I, they also are training all new members of the team. They have met with success by taking second place at the Poly 10 way and have one of the best heavyweights in the state. This Saturday, they compete at Carter High School for the AAC Finals. Good luck to our Bruins elite wrestling team. If you are not aware, we have a legacy of victory with our soccer teams. Girls soccer are Sunkissed sun League champs once again and compete against Rialto tonight. Boys began against Kaiser earlier today for the top spot in their league, and we just got news that the, of the result of their game today, and they are now San Andres League champs. 
The postseason is underway, so please join us in wishing them luck and congratulating them for a great new season. Our ASB president, Andrew Veloz, was unable to attend tonight at the last minute, so I will share his activities portion of our, of our spotlight with you on his behalf. On October 22nd, we had our fifth annual Fall Fest. The whole Bloomington community came together to enjoy some good food, game, games, and music in our beautiful NPR courtyard right after school. Most of the games involved food, so many Bruins wanted to participate. We had a pretzel eating contest, an ice cream eating contest, and even a stein holding contest. We played German music and clubs sold snacks to raise funds for their clubs. The following week, we had our Halloween costume contest at lunch. Teachers came out to judge costumes that fit into our cute, funny, creative, scary, and couple group categories. Winners got goodie basket and all participants got a small gift for joining in for the fun. As November came around, so did Powderpuff football. The favorite Bruin tradition caused a lot of talk around campus. Junior girls took, it, took on the senior girls in a head-to-head -head flag football match at the Bloomington Community Stadium. Before the game, we introduced both teams at lunch and watched as they faced off in a series of competitive challenges. Seniors ended up winning the game 24 to 18. Before Thanksgiving break, we held our thankfulness day we celebrated at lunch with some fun-filled activities, such as coloring, a pie eating contest, and a Thanksgiving spin-off on hot potato that we called hot yam. And right before finals in December, we thought it would be a perfect it would be perfect to bring in the holiday season with a winter spirit week. Each day of the week, we had a different dress-up theme. Bruin wore their pajamas, plaid printed clothing festive socks and hats, and ended off the week, the cold week, by bringing their favorite blanket. With the second semester well on its way, we are preparing for our activities to come. We held Macho Volleyball signups earlier this month and held an informational meeting with all the participants. We are super excited for this tournament coming up in March. We also have a skating party coming up, a spring fling event, movie nights, and more. We sure stay busy in brewing country. Graduation is just over three months away. So this past week, we welcomed Bell 4 to our campus so seniors could purchase items such as their cap and gown, graduation announcements, and senior swag. This is, a, this is when it all comes real for our seniors, and it sure is a bittersweet moment. Currently, ASB and Link Crew are excited for our winter sport rallies coming up on February 11th. This year's theme is Mario Kart, the race for the Bruin Cup. We can't wait to honor our winter sport teams, teachers of the month, highest GPAs, and also enjoy class competitions like the class yell. Thank you for allowing us to present about our school today. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, board member comments or questions? How's that? Samantha, Angela, thank you very much for bringing such a great presentation. Thank you for bringing such awesome activities, everything that's going on, the upcoming activities, uh, Winter Rally, the Friendship Week, Skating Party, man, that's going to be fun. Fun, fun, fun. Keeping everyone busy at Bloomington High School. So thank you very much for, for bringing this great presentation. Ms. Roman, your staff, thank you. Please let them know. Uh, Ms. Wright, thank you very much also for being the ASB teacher out there and letting, getting these students motivated and going, uh, the leadership there at Bloomington High School. So please let them know that we appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Uh, it, it's awesome to hear all the great activities going on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, yes, Samantha and Angela, I want to thank you for your presentation. And I want to thank you uh, and all of your uh, colleagues who work on the ASB and your director, because this year more than ever, ASB has been 
very, very important for all our students. We know that it's a very difficult year, and yet you are the ones who keep the spirit going on the campus. And I know it's not as easy to do wearing a mask and doing all the things you have to do, but we want to just say thank you for keeping the, the Bruin spirit alive at Bloomington High School. And thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Are there comments? No. Okay. I also want to take this opportunity to thank both of you for the wonderful uh, report. And uh, if you could take back uh, our congratulations to your uh, boys and girls soccer team for their championships in their leagues and all the other sports who have done really well, we would appreciate that. And uh, just keep up the good work because like my colleagues mentioned, you're the catalysts that keep the the campuses and the students going on a daily basis. And uh, just uh, keep the school spirit going. And like you mentioned just a little while ago about um, the end of the school year, it will be here before we know it. And uh, so there's just a little bit more time for you to reach out to all the students and, and keep those uh, great activities going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one more thing. I just want to congratulate you on on the on your presentation and the way you put it together. You you addressed academics, you addressed athletics, you addressed activities, and each one of those is very very important. You know, of course, the academics is the priority where the you know the your your classrooms and your grades and your assignments is are highly important. And um, but you know, athletics also has a very important in very important part, plays an important part in your school, which is, you know, it addresses fun, it addresses health. Um, you know, you got to keep healthy and outdoors and activities. Um, and also in activities, I, I like the way you address your the spirit, like like our, my colleague said, spirit, and also uh, your the culture of your school. And I just want to congratulate uh, Ms. Roman. Uh, for doing an excellent job, as well as her staff that's sitting here today. Um, and congratulations, girls. Thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on to public comments 3.1. Board Bylaw 9323 states that individual speakers shall be allowed three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item. The board shall limit the total time for public input on each item to 15 minutes. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public presentation depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. The president may take a poll of speakers for or against a particular issue and may ask that additional persons speak only if they have something new to add. I would like to clarify the process for public comment and ask that the appropriate public comment card be filled out. Each speaker will uh, again be invited to the podium and we ask that you begin by stating your name and your city of residence. Okay, there are no public comments this evening, so we're going to move on to administrative presentations. Uh, first of all, we have the um, from the Department of Behavioral and Mental Health uh, Student Services Division, we have Antonio Castro presenting today. Good evening, Board President Aragin, members of the board, and Dr. Miranda. It's my pleasure to introduce Antonio Castro, CJUSD's Behavior and Mental Health Manager. He'll be discussing a relevant and pertinent topic, our comprehensive school-based mental health program tonight. Mr. Thank Castro. You. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz, and good evening, President, uh, Board President Aragin, uh, board members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and to all of the community members in attendance tonight, uh, it's an honor to be here tonight and sincerely grateful just to be able to share a little bit about the story of our program, of our, of our comprehensive mental health program with you tonight.
Next slide. So it is, you know, without doubt that the pandemic shed a humongous, uh, you know, spotlight on mental health. And so much so that there were many professionals in the field of academia and mental health that really warned us about the importance of not just jumping back into curriculum without putting systems in place, without addressing the social and emotional needs of our students upon returning to in-person learning. Next slide. I think we skipped that uh, slide. We can go back. But the reality is, is that it's not just the pandemic, you know, that really shed light on the mental health of our students. The reality is, is that mental health has always been critical. It's always been important in education. Um, in fact, much of what we've learned about the science of the brain and the science of mental health is teaching us that when a student is in a survival state, when a student is dealing with stressful life circumstances and situations, when a child or a student in our school district is experiencing mental health symptoms of anxiety or depression or stress, that they are not able to really activate and engage that learning part of their brain. So again, it is important that we put systems in place in our school district that are going to help our children to access that learning part of the brain. And that is exactly what our mental health program is all about. It's about giving kids a fair opportunity to access learning. Next slide, please. When I came to the school district back in 2016, I had two very important objectives uh, in order to put together this mental health program, which came about in 2017. Uh, the two objectives were very simple. One was to create a comprehensive mental health program that addressed the child's ecosystem. It's the idea that when children do not have their most basic needs met, they are not able to really become the best versions of themselves. It is the simple idea when the, that when a child is hungry, that when a child does not have the most basic needs met, such as food and clothing and shelter, that they cannot really prioritize learning in, edu in education. So we needed to understand and consider that in building this mental health program. The second very important uh, objective of, of in creating this mental health program was to create a multi-tiered system of mental health support. In mental health, there are three very important tiers. There are those students that are experiencing mild symptoms of mental health, moderate symptoms of mental health, and severe symptoms of mental health. And so our program, with case management as a foundation, uh, really needed to establish a system to make sure that all of these levels of care, or all these levels of mental health are being addressed in our school district. Next slide. So again, I'm happy to report that in 2016, 20, in the 2017, 2018 school year, we officially launched our mental health program and we accomplished, we accomplished the important task of creating a comprehensive and centralized system of care where any one of our students in our school district from all our elementary schools to our middle schools, to our high schools, and even our adult ed program have free access to mental health services. So what happens is that any one of our school sites can refer a student to our mental health program. Our mental health program goes through the important process of, re of sifting through that child's needs, assessing the needs of that child, and connecting that child to the important level of care that is needed. And again, the idea here is to make sure that that child is going to benefit from the right resource, from the right level of care, and that is exactly what our program is here to do, is to make sure that any kid that is referred to our program gets exactly what they need in terms of their mental health and their social and emotional needs. Next slide, please. We should all be so proud, by the way, that our school district has uh, a system of support, right? Uh, in this graphic here, you see our student population, are over 20-something thousand students in our school district in the, in the center of this, of this slide. And I want you to notice all of the different social and emotional supports that we have put together for our students, from our mental health program to our case management program that I will be talking about in just a, in just a couple seconds here, and also to our community liaisons, a humongous shout out to our community liaisons within our school student services division who provide some of the most basic needs for our homeless and foster youth. We also have established a suicide prevention and intervention protocol that outlines specifically how we intervene on the behalf of students that are dealing with suicidal ideation. We have our amazing wellness centers that I will be touching on and highlighting and praising in just a minute. Uh, we have our PBIS system that is the foundation uh, of, of how we are teaching and, and, and creating a culture uh, within our school district. We have our school counselors, we have our ERMS counselors, we have our EL counselors, which are all on the front lines of dealing with children that are dealing, that are experiencing social and emotional issues. 
We have our community providers. We have important relationships. Our mental health program has established partnerships and connections with very important community providers that I will be highlighting in a couple more slides. And last but not least, very relevant for today, we have a, an established district uh, crisis team that will respond to situations where children are dysregulated because of some situation that happens in a school. And we are there to serve and help those children to deescalate their, their crises or their emotional crises. So we have a lot of supports in place. And the bottom line here is that we have, uh, our mental health program really serves as the glue to all of these different resources and supports. It's all about collaboration and it's all about a coordinated effort to make sure that our students have all of their social and emotional needs met to the extent that we can support them and we have the resources available in our school district. Next slide, please. <clears throat> there's a lot of information. I just wanna take a pause to see if there's any questions at this point. Any questions? Okay, Mr. Barr. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, report to the point and welcome. Uh, my question is, can you share a little bit about more about what community uh, resources or providers do uh, does the district access for our uh, students and maybe for their families? Absolutely, Mr. Ibarra, and I actually have uh, a slide with some of that information. If it's okay with you, I'd like to present that in just a couple minutes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Mr. Flynn. Yes, uh, today was a good example. I was able to be there uh, on your crisis team. I was at Joe Baca Middle School this morning uh, during a situation that we had. And I just want to commend you and your team for the fast, fast service of getting out there, getting uh, those kids that needed uh, to talk to someone, making them feel comfortable. I was there. And uh, as you're sharing this information with us, I commend you. I commend, I commend the department, and you have a great mental health department. And the leadership you can see in you, Mr. Uh, Antonio Castro, and your team. I know some of them here. I see some familiar faces from this morning. They might not recognize me without my bulletproof vest, but uh, uh, I want to thank you for, for for coming out and and uh, just being there for those kids, for the families. I know you were out there also talking to some of the parents and uh, the situation was, was, was taken care of. Uh, I could feel I could feel the comfort from the kids. You know, I kind of walked by where you had the kids, you were talking to some of them and stuff, and you could feel that they felt safe. They, they knew they were in a, in a good place. So thank you. Thank you very, very much for, for all you do. You're so welcome, Mr. Fuentes. Thank you so much for the feedback, sir. Thank you. You want to proceed, or is there any other question? Next slide, please. I have a couple more slides. So I'd like to just also um, break down the three different levels of supports that we have for the different levels of mental health needs. So for those students that are experiencing mild symptoms of mental health, we have these preventative resources and supports uh, and, and things that we are doing for our students in our school district. So I'd like to highlight some of those important things that we are doing out of our mental health department. Next slide, please. First and foremost, I wanna begin uh, by talking about our case management program. Our case, manage uh, case management program goes back to the slide that I showed with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Ma the case management program exists in order to remove the barriers that are keeping children from prioritizing education. Again, the idea is very simple, that if a child is hungry, that if a child does not have the most basic needs met, really education and even sometimes mental health takes a back seat. So our case management program exists in order to support the, the most basic needs of our families, from providing linkage and referral to education, to connecting to resources in our community uh, or from within. Our case management program does an amazing job of sitting down with families, assessing their basic needs and supporting them through the entire process. I can sit here and tell you all kinds of stories about the families that we've served. You know, we have the single mother who recently lost her husband that in her grieving process really needed a lot of support for her children, for herself. And, and during this process, this, this very humble mother decided to adopt a child. So even during her grief, she needed some support. She needed some resources so that she can be able to adopt this kid and support her, her own children. You know, there's the story about the grandmother that recently adopted her four grandchildren because unfortunately, 
her, her older daughter is abusing drugs and substances. And so she needed some support. She needed some basic needs and some resources, including mental health support for her kids as well. I'd like to, by the way, acknowledge Ms. Leslie Maldonado. If you can just quickly stand, Ms. Maldonado. Amazing uh, you know, therapist and supervisor and manages our case management program. I, you can see the results. You can see the impact that we have here uh, on our families. In the very first part of the school year, we have served approximately 175 families. And these are some of the most basic needs that we've supported those families with, from connecting them to after school programs, helping with the most basic needs like food and shelter, uh, to connecting to low cost dental, uh, providing uh, resources for employment and legal resources and medical care and social services and so on. Our case managers do an amazing job. And I would be remiss if I didn't at least acknowledge our case managers that may be in attendance. If you can just please raise your hand. Thank you so much. We have six uh, amazing case managers in our program. They are our bachelor's level university students, and they are all overseen by Ms. Leslie Maldonado. Next slide, please. The next preventative support that I'd like to highlight is our wellness centers. I am so incredibly honored, by the way, to present to you tonight, uh, who are actually in attendance, uh, our wellness center coordinators. But let me first tell you about the wellness centers and, and the purpose of the wellness centers that we have established at our comprehensive high schools. I want to begin with a quote, by the way, by Dr. Bruce Perry. Dr. Bruce Perry is a leading researcher, is a leading author in, in the realm of trauma and the impact that trauma has on our children. And I, and I quote from Dr. Bruce Perry that the more healthy relationships that a child has, the more likely he will be to recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. Dr. Bruce Perry, along with other experts in the field, clearly uh, have uh, you know, given us the knowledge that when we create relationships with children, when we create environments where we you know, help kill children to feel connected, where they feel safe both physically and emotionally, they absolutely thrive. The wellness centers are, have been established to provide short-term, targeted and trauma-informed interventions that some of them even target the nervous system because again, the science teaches us that when the, sci when the nervous system is in a good place, children are able to activate that learning part of their brain. So our amazing wellness center coordinators do a great job of meeting with many, many students throughout the school day, throughout the week, who are in a very dysregulated state. So they help them, they provide support, and these children greatly benefit, and they have a fair chance to learn. That's the bottom line. The wellness centers exist in order to give kids a fair chance to learn throughout the school day. So I wanna acknowledge them real quick. If you wouldn't mind standing, please, as I call your name. I wanna begin by introducing to you Ms. Yesenia Aleman. She is the wellness center coordinator for Bloomington High School. Next, I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Evelyn Villa. She's the wellness center coordinator from Colton High School. And last but not least, Mr. Robert Harris, if you can please stand. He is the wellness center coordinator for Grand Terrace High School. These three amazing young people, by the way, are also graduates from our mental health program. They are now professionals in the field and they have been contracted by the three high schools to oversee and coordinate the services at the wellness center. On the right here, you can see the impact that they've made already. You know, at each of the high schools at this point have already serviced over 600 students per high school. We're talking about more than 1,800 students have received check-in services or wellness services in our wellness center. So these are students that have directly benefited uh, from the services that they provide. And again, we're giving kids a fair chance to learn and focus on their education during the school day. Next slide, please. Any questions up until this point? No questions. Thank you. Next slide, please. The next level of care that I wanna highlight is early intervention. So early intervention is now a little bit more targeted, uh, long-term support that we are providing for our students. So basically it boils down to therapeutic services and that is exactly what the mental health program uh, provides. We provide targeted mental health uh, treatment and counseling for our students in our school district. Next slide, please. There are so many uh, uh, you know, services that we provide, but before I do that, I wanna highlight our mental health interns and our staff. So in our program, we have 38 mental health interns in our program right now. Um, we have six university partnerships that provide us, the, the, the university students that are part of our mental health program. By the way, we have some of our mental health interns in attendance tonight. if you can just please raise your hand. These are just a few of the 38 that we have in our team. Thank you so much for coming. 
Um, I want to also acknowledge the universities that we have these relationships with. So Cal State San Bernardino, Cal State Fullerton, Azusa Pacific, Cal Baptist, Arizona State, and hopefully after tonight, the University of Massachusetts Global, which is an internet, uh, an online program. We have four contracted uh, licensed supervisors. One of them is in attendance tonight, Ms. Christina. You can just raise your hand, please. Uh, and we have three others. So ultimately, we have six licensed clinical therapists that are providing the supervision for all of these mental health interns. And of course, there are uh, th uh, three staff, including myself, Ms. Leslie, and we have our new secretary. Again, you can see the needs. These are some of the trends that we are serving this year. This is what our students are bringing to the table this year. We're talking to students that are dealing with depression. The incident of suicidal ideation has gone tremendously uh, high in the last couple of years, and certainly this year that we've come back to in-person learning. Our kids are very dysregulated this year. Generally speaking, we have a lot of students dealing with anxiety, with grief and loss. You know, when it comes to grief and loss, by the way, it's a really sad situation, but it's something that is very common in our school district. There are a lot of kids who have lost loved ones and relatives uh, and are just struggling. You know, they're really struggling to try to cope with the grief and loss and again, prioritize education. We're dealing with kids that have experienced trauma, some pretty intense trauma and adverse childhood experiences in their lives. We have many students that we support that are part of the LGBT community who are dealing with so much stress and so much grief because of what it, you know, because of the world that they live in. And then last but not least, we have so much need in the EL in our newcomer community. These young people bring so much, uh, they have such amazing stories to tell of resiliency, but there's also a lot of stress and a lot of trauma that these kids are dealing with. There's one particular kid, by the way, that I'd like to quickly share about. I'm gonna call him Juan just to protect his identity. This young man came to our, our school district about two years ago from Mexico, but approximately 10 years ago, his father was murdered in Mexico. But since that, that incident, which he witnessed, um, he's really struggled, you know, he struggled. He lived in Mexico for several years after the murder of his father, uh, but he struggled with PTSD-like symptoms. He struggled to, you know, with nightmares, with bad memories, and this constant state of fear of survival. Long story short, two years ago, he came to this country, and, you know, he had not really had the opportunity to deal with the grief and loss, much less the trauma of the loss of his father. But through the work uh, with one of our mental health interns, I am so proud to report that Juan has made tremendous, tremendous improvement. He is working through his grief and loss. He is working through the trauma, and he is now really starting to prioritize education and he is thriving. He is doing so well. We have so much that we do as well in terms of the services that we provide and you see them there from individual to crisis to groups and so on and so on. I'd like to highlight that we also support our parents as well from our program. There are many parents of the students that we are serving that also have their own symptoms of mental health. And last but not least, our, our staff. We have to help those on the front lines and we've had to do that this year more than ever to support the social, the, the, their, their emotional wellness, their social and emotional wellness. So it's been really an honor to work with our staff. On the right, you can see there the, you know, the growth of our program. We launched the program in 2017 and we touched a few hundred students with the small group that we had. You can see that we've doubled in size almost every single year in terms of the students that we have reached. This year alone, in the very first semester, going into the second semester, we have already surpassed the number of students that we have seen any other year since we've been in existence. So we have seen well over 550 students or we have received that many referrals in our program requesting services. And again, more than any other year. So the need is great and greater than ever this school year. Next slide, please. And then last but not least, I'd like to close out with our intensive supports. And again, our intensive supports are for those students that are experiencing the highest level of mental health needs. Next slide, please. These are just some of the community partnerships that we've established uh, and that I'm very proud to, to present to you tonight. Uh, we have South Coast Community Services that is there to meet the needs of those highest level, uh, those kids that are experiencing highest level of, of mental health. We have Victory Community Support Services and a host of services from San Bernardino County and the Department of Behavioral Health. One that I really want to highlight though is South Coast Community Services. I'm very proud to share with our board tonight and with our community members that uh, the, the County of San Bernardino has allotted some monies to South Coast to exclusively uh, provide four staff to our, our, to our school district free of cost. That's a humongous gain for our school district because again, the needs are higher than ever. And we are so grateful, you know, through that, that the county would consider our school district in providing those extra supports. 
So these are just some of the highlights of our program. Um, again, it's not uh, a perfect situation. We're doing the best that we can, but it's an honor to say that in our school district, we have established a comprehensive program for our kids. Thank Any you. questions? Thank you, Antonio. Before I, I open it up for, for mem member comments, I would like to just pause to applaud your amazing staff. A lot of them are here today. They're here, um, you know, to share um, with us. So I would just like to just to applaud them for their passion, their dedication to our students. Thank you so much. Thank Board you. member comments. Hey, Ms. Harrell. I just want to uh, thank you, Mr. Castro, for all you've done since you've come to Fulton and spearheaded this program. I hope you can hear me. I'm sorry. Um, we have made tremendous, tremendous strides in mental health for our students. It is so, so crucial that we have these opportunities for our students. As you said, uh, who knew when you came here in 2000? I mean, we knew there was a need in 2016. That's why we brought you here. But who knew that after when you after you were hired, then there would be a pandemic and students would be learning at home. And then now they're having, uh, you know, and now they're coming back from learning at home and, and the, the additional trauma that they're going through now. So uh, just a tremendous thank you to you and to everyone who works with you because you are truly, um, our students are the most important thing. That's why we're all here. And you are doing God's work mm -hmm. in helping take care of those students. Because we always talk about academics because that's what a school district is here for. But there can't be any academics without mental health. They have to have that frame of mind. And the other reason I want to thank you is that we are one of the few districts to have this type of department and we are blessed that we have it but not only do we use it for colton i know we've had situations where for lack of a better word we loaned out your department to redlands when they had a student commit suicide and they do not have a mental health and our people went over there to help with their situation so, so I am so, so proud of our district for having the forethought in 2016 to bring you on to start this program and to realize there was the need for this program. And unfortunately, the need will continue because um, we're going to see still a lot of residual effects long after this pandemic is over, there's always going to be the need for a mental health group. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that each and every one of you does because you truly are making a difference. So thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you so much for the presentation. Um, my fellow board member said so much of what I wanted to say. Um, this program is probably, in my opinion, the most important thing a district can do for kids. I spent my entire life working in education from kindergarten on up. Um, as a teacher in the classroom, you saw kids hurting. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> um, as a teacher in the classroom, you see so many boys and girls that need help, and typically there's a, maybe a counselor that you share. Um, but to have the number of counselor and with your <clears throat> forethought of of bringing in interns to give them the experience they need with the services they provide to our children is an unbelievable gift from God, to my opinion. Um, <clears throat> when you deal with discipline in the classroom and at the in the school office you see boys and girls that the real issue is something emotional and their mental health issues and yes there are a few community resources you can go to for long term but not a whole lot so to me to have this in this district 
It's a <clears throat> It's an amazing program that meets the needs of so many kids. You know, you go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When there's safety and security, kids feel emotionally connected and they do better in school. So we're not only helping them mental health wise, but we're helping them be able to become learners to give them a, a hope for a future. It all boils down to hope. So every one of you out there who are in this program, you thank you for giving our children mm -hmm. hope because there are so many kids who don't have it. and. Mm -hmm. I believe that we will see a better graduation rate continuing because we have met the needs of these kids when they're little and continue that up through our wellness centers and all stuff. And I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing that for our children. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Board Member Flores. Thank you. Uh, this, is, this is fantastic. Um, a couple of specific questions, and, and the value of these services is immense. It's going to grow. Acknowledging the uh, relationship between mental health and a, a student's ability to succeed, right? That's the first step, and, and we're making that acknowledgement and that investment. Um, I, I work for, uh, I run a, a homeless services agency where we provide many of the same services to adults who experienced everything that you just described when they were children, and oftentimes that early childhood trauma is what led to a lot of the issues that they later exhibited in life. Um, want to ask a couple of specific questions. We're seeing increased rates of substance use disorder, obviously. Um, and I imagine, uh, certainly in adults, we have that. I don't know. I've not seen data or statistics on, on children, uh, youth, teens, etc. cetera. Uh, I imagine, though, there's probably a correlation. We're seeing some of that. Curious to know how we're handling uh, that with either providers, partners, referrals, um, when we encounter a student that we think may um, be abusing substances? Great question. Thank you, Ms. Flores. Yes, we are doing, uh, we have our partnerships that we rely on for this level of care. It's a very specialized level of care, as, we, as, as you can imagine, with substance abuse. So we actually have a relationship, a great working relationship with South Coast to provide those very specific services for our students in our school district. They have amazing staff and curriculum that's been vetted by the county. And so they provide uh, targeted supports, mental health supports, specifically for those kids that are struggling with substance abuse. And we also try to do prevention. Um, so it's not so much treatment, but we do prevention around the topic of substance abuse. And that is something, by the way, I wanna big, give a big shout out to the Colton High School Wellness Center for beginning that this school year. It's been an issue for a long time. But we have now, now are delving into that specific area of mental health, which is substance abuse. So we have our community partners that definitely take the bulk of that. And we are just now as a program kind of delving into that, but more from a preventative perspective, because it's not something that we want to handle in-house. I think it really belongs for those specialized programs. Right, right. And the South Coast, is it, is it an outpatient program that they have? Like yes, that is correct. The other amazing resources that we have for students that need more than outpatient is we have a relationship with the county that has specialized inpatient programs and intensive outpatient programs for kids that need that level of care as well that are struggling with substance abuse. It's really just a matter of linking and connecting them and being aware that the resource is there. That's the other reason why our case management program is so important because when a child needs that level of care, it's not just a matter of giving a phone number and saying, here you go, mom, here's a resource. It's the matter of sitting down and making sure that there isn't a language barrier, that there, the stigma is, is, is a wall in and of itself. It's a barrier in and of itself. So our case management program will make sure or ensure that that family gets connected to that level of care, whether it's with the county for more intensive services or if it's in an outpatient situation, we connect them to South Coast. No, and, and there's no question that you want to make sure that you're there to follow through because when you're dealing with issues of substance abuse, you may only have a short window of time where that individual is, is sober and has that moment of clarity yes. and is willing to accept the help, and you've got to catch it right then and there. Yes, sir. Uh, and I can only imagine you have parents who may not know that their child is using substances, abusing substances, and that itself is a difficult conversation to have. So I, I commend you because um, I work with adults, and it's challenging. When yeah. you add the dynamic of children and parents and families, uh, it's even more complex. Um, just curious, one of the one of the areas of resources that I noted um, on your list was housing. Um, this is a challenge that we find immensely. Uh, the need for housing across the board is tremendous. A, a, affordable housing, market rate housing that they can afford. We have families that are doubled up, tripled up, living in garages, RVs, cars. 
The rate of homelessness amongst um, students in this county is, uh, continues to grow. Curious what providers we use when folks come to you and you realize, hey, we, we have to help this family with some housing. What resources, what providers, what track do we tend to go when it comes to that? Because that is a struggle. Certainly. That is a great question. And we actually tend to rely on whatever community resources we have available. I'd have to be uh, uh, humble and say that the person with that knowledge would be Ms. Maldonado, who runs our case management program. So either I can after come up and give a report or I can. You can provide that maybe in board correspondence. That Absolutely. Would be fine. And, and one of the things that, I, again, I learned getting into this business, which is which is incredibly important, is um, let's say, for example, we help place a family into a shelter or some kind of situation such as that. Yes. By law, by right, the students have the right to remain in our school district irrespective of where they're placed. So they may be placed into housing in Fontana, San Bernardino, Rialto, or even a little further out. If they, uh, those parents have a right to, those kids are still ours and have a right to still send their kids to the school. So there's continuity in their education and their relationships. Um, again, as a provider, that's what we do. So we may have a student coming to us from Fontana, living with us in our San Bernardino home, but we still make sure that kid gets to the school because we're trying to limit, um, obviously, uh, the trauma that can come from bouncing around and, and having reestablished relationships. Anyway, that's actually a law that it, it's fantastic to know that there's continuity and the county superintendent of schools does a great job working with us. Uh, so uh, again, some, something I'm sure you're aware of and your staff is yes. aware of, but I want to share with our board that there are laws that help um, provide support for homeless families as they find housing and shelter in different areas. They can remain in their home school districts. So, and transportation has to be provided uh, in many cases. So. I'd also like to just point out again, just a big shout out to our community liaisons within student services who also provide a lot of resources to our homeless and foster youth. So we also connect with them and have a great working relationship with them within our own program. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That's all. Okay. Well, no other board member comments? Well, Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you for your for your dedication again and your expertise and your guidance. Thank your staff. And by the way, I wanted to say thank you for the book that you provided us a few several weeks ago. It's on my coffee table. I pick it up and it's amazing. I want I I, I personally use it all the time, every day. So thank you again for You're the welcome. presentation. Thank you. Our next presentation is going to be an update on COVID-19 guidelines. From This is a presentation by uh, Human Resources and Student Services Division. Human Resources uh, is Assistant Superintendent Dade and our Superintendent from Student Services, uh, Dr. Ortiz. Good evening, board. Board President, Mrs. Adegin, board members, Dr. Dr. Miranda, our superintendent, and all, everyone in the audience. <clears throat> Tonight, I just briefly want to um, give everybody an update on the California Department of Public Health and Cal OSHA return to work guidelines. Next slide, please. So on, on December 16th, um, the Cal OSHA COVID-19 prevention emergency, emergency temporary standards were updated for the second time. And the purpose of the update was to, to align the requirements with the latest recommendations um, and requirements from the public health department. And so these all took effect on January the 14th. Next slide, please. So the re revision was to close contact, return a person who was a close contact to work time frame. And so the time frame was shortened essentially. And with our with our human resources and our district nurse team, um, we're working with our employees to implement this new time frame and make sure that everybody returns to work as soon as possible, but healthy. Next slide, please. So essentially, if you're experiencing any COVID-19 related symptoms, um, you've been exposed to a positive individual or you've tested positive for COVID-19, you must contact your immediate supervisor. And this, tr this triggers the contact tracing process. Next slide, please. And so in scenario one, if you test positive, whether you have symptoms or not, Next click. You, you're asked to isolate until you have no symptoms and you test negative. Now the revision comes into place here. So it used to be 10 days. Now on day five or later, which is critical, day five or later, 
you can test. If your symptoms are gone or resolving you, and you have a, a, a test that comes back negative, you can return to work immediately. Okay, next. Now, for those who, for some reason, are not able to get to a testing center or just not interested in testing, your isolation period ends on day, on day 10, and you can return to work on day 11. And once again, symptoms have to be resolving or gone. Any questions so far on the, on the revisions? Okay, awesome. Next slide. So scenario two, if you were exposed to a, a COVID-19 positive individual, next click. You, no matter what, you have to quarantine for five days, if, even if you test negative. Next click. Once again, the revision comes into place here, and there's two revisions, so this is one of two. You can go test on day five or later. If symptoms are resolving or gone, um, and you have a negative test result, you can return to work. And the second revision is if you're fully vaccinated and you have your, your booster, or you've been recently vaccinated within six months, you can bypass the, the quarantine process completely and remain at work. Any questions? Questions from the board? Okay. Well, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Good evening, uh, Board President Adeguin, Board Members, Dr. Miranda, members of the audience. Uh, I'm going to be talking about group contact tracing tonight. Next slide. Since returning from uh, winter break uh, in terms of dealing and managing uh, the new variant, uh, we've had an, an influx of positive cases where, you know, staff and students. Uh, contact tracing the way we have right now, the, the individual contact tracing, has been difficult, uh, especially in following up with students and families. We've had an increased volume of calls to the school offices, and in you know that's been difficult to manage because we've had limited staff due to staff being out, uh, and then also administration being called to go substitute in classrooms. So uh, also just completing the laser fish, which is the information that we collect when someone is a student test positive. Uh, and then even trying to get contract t contact tracers from our agencies that we work with, uh, they don't have anyone to send us. So it, it's just been very difficult, uh, as all of you acknowledged the last, uh, at the last board meeting. So next slide. So as we, since COVID started, we've taken our guidance from the California Department of Public Health. The focus in California, and it's our, our, the, the, this board's goal as well, is to keep schools open, safe, kids in classrooms, uh, and trying to, as much as possible, keep in-school transmission low, in addition to keeping our staff safe. So the state has adapted to all the different challenges that the virus has presented, uh, and they've updated their guidelines, not only just for staff, but for students, and they've responded with just different strategies that we know work against the virus. So like I said, currently we are using the individual contact tracing framework. And if you think of like concentric circles, it starts with that person who is positive and they go out as far as looking into who has, was a close contact to that person. So that, that model, that framework has been difficult to maintain given now with the Omicron variant and the transmissibility of that variant. So on January 12th, the California Department of Public Health introduced a group contract tracing framework. Next slide. The advantages of the group contact tracing is due to, uh, it is possible due to the shorter incubation period. So we know within that first two or three days is when symptoms normally show. Uh, and also due to the increased transmissibility of the variant, this group contact tracing model allows us to uh, participate or follow it. Uh, it allows for a quicker and broader response to parents and families through quicker uh, communication, testing, and isolation protocols. And more importantly, like I said, it allows for us to maintain uh, safe in-person instruction instead of relying on the more intense individual contact tracing. Needless to say, the other mitigation efforts that we are using as far as vaccination, boosters, uh, wearing high-quality, well-fitting masks, 
uh, staying home and testing if, if they are symptomatic and also improving indoor air quality still remain very effective against the, the virus. Next slide. So what, one of the things that has changed is the definition of exposure. So now we're talking about students who spend a cumulative of 15 minutes within a 24 hour period in a shared indoor space with someone who is positive. But you'll notice what is left out from that definition is that within six feet. So that's, that's the one thing that has changed in this new model. Next slide. Uh, and just a clarification, isolation refers to those folks who are infected and quarantine reflect, uh, refers to those folks who have been uh, exposed to someone who is infected. Both of those methods have been proven uh, effective against the virus and trying to keep transmissibility low. Next slide. This slide just shows a comparison between the two models, so the individual and group based you'll notice that they are very similar. Um, regardless, students with COVID-19 are, are by recommend, you know, uh, based on the guidance from California Department of Public Health, do isolate. The difference between those who are exposed, so normally with the individual, we identify those individuals, like I said, who are within six feet, at least for 15 minutes within a 24 hour period. Now we're identifying groups uh, who share the same indoor space for at least 15 minutes within 24 hours, but that six feet is removed from that. So where the, it says actions, the, the arrows, this is a critical difference as well. In individual, uh, is recommended that they either not quarantine, uh, depending on how close they were to that person, or follow our typical standard quarantine guidelines. For the group, what happens is, and imagine a class, a third grade class of 30 students. So if we have one student who is uh, infected, then the other 29 students can remain. On that days three through five, which is when normally symptoms start happening with this new variant, uh, those families should have their, kid, their students tested. And if they remain uh, negative or no symptoms, then they can remain attending school following all the other mitigation efforts that we've done. Uh, if they test positive or start demonstrating symptoms, then they follow the same typical protocols of the, the tending quarantine. Um, testing for the individual happens with all individuals, depending on their, uh, you know, the quarantine category, depending on how close their contact was with that person. For group, again, on days three through five, it is recommended or suggested that all students in that period in that class should be tested during days three through five. Uh, the advantages for the individual is it maintains current operations so we can still manage uh, with the, the students that are there. There is a targeted approach to uh, trying to isolate those individuals who are, who are close contacts or who are positive, but also with the group, it allows for a quicker response because once we know, we identify, whereas with the individual, you have to kind of work your way out to see who had contact so it delays response. For the group, it's a little quicker, broader, because we send it now to a whole class, a whole group of students, and there's an increased efficiency in terms of our practice. The last one that is probably most important is the individual contact tracing is predicated on contact tracing, F finding who is positive, and then working our way out to see who is a close contact group-based uh, contact tracing is predicated on testing. On that days three through five, it's very important that students, families should have their children tested during that time period. And again, if they test positive or have symptoms, remain home, let the school know, and we follow our typical process. Next slide. So this is just a, a summary of the steps that we are following. First step is we do send a group uh, exposure notification letter and the school notifies the nurse that there is a student that has tested positive. Second site administration like we have been doing informs all staff who were exposed or had contact with that student. Any asymptomatic students can attend school, monitor for symptoms, and should test on days three through five. And now with our work uh, partnership with COVID clinic, we do have our parents have the ability to go to one of the four cottages at our schools and have their child tested. 
and any symptomatic students are quarantined and get tested just like our normal process is. So very simplified steps there on that slide, but there are other conditions that happen, but that in essence is how this works. Next slide. So how does it function? Uh, we do have a, an app called Parent Square. It is one method that our schools have found uh, successful in communicating with parents. So parents will, again, utilizing that very simple model of a third grade class, 30 students, one student is, is infected, uh, the other 29 students will receive a message from Parent Square with the infographic there in the middle. And if the parents click on that infographic, they get the letter that's next to that infographic that indicates what the steps they should take. And everything that I just explained is in that letter. So the four steps of, uh, you know, informing them that they can continue to attend class as long as there's no symptoms or they're not positive, uh, informing the parents to test their children days three through five. Uh, and then if they are positive, make sure they keep them home or demonstrating symptoms and then encouraging to them to talk to their doctor or healthcare provider to look into vaccination or boosters if that, if that is in, of interest to them. So at that point, they just communicate with the school to make sure. The letter will indicate when their child, uh, the infectious date of the student who was infected, it indicates that date at the top. So the parents know days, three days from that point, they should get their child tested. Next slide. Any questions? Question. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Ortiz. Okay, now we do have our next presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Harrell. Dr. Ortiz, can I call you back? Sure. I just, I just wanted to make a comment. Actually, I just wanted to say um, things are changing so rapidly. It's like you know, they're selling you, uh, you know, the, the time now to quarantine and all the different things. Everything is just changing. It's like every, it seems like every day. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I watch the news and I'm like, I get, it's mind boggling how much it, it continues to change. Um, my question was where is uh, where you talked about uh wearing an appropriate mask okay like right now i'm double masking because i understand that uh, they're saying the n95 mask is supposed to be the best against the omicron and i understand that the county was supposed to send the district some and we're supposed to distribute them yes. uh, so that was my main my, i don't know if you know or yes. when uh, that distribution is going to happen is that for students is that for staff who is that for it was uh and just so you know i have mine below my nose because the glasses are fogging up. So I apologize, I can't see the slides without it. So, um, but yeah, that is correct. We received about 70,000 N95 masks. Those were distributed, I believe last Friday um, to the schools based on population. So each school got more than enough for one per staff member or student. Uh, schools, the principals made decisions depending on, I know I, Bought some for my family, but for my uh, nine-year-old, they, they were adult size, so they were it was too big for him. So that is the type that the size that we received was adult size. So principals could test to see if it would fit our little kindergartners or so. They could give them one or a couple, uh, but I did ask them to just make sure that they would be usable for uh, fit them well to be able to use. Uh, but otherwise, Miss Otto, that every school, every staff member should have at least received one but possible that they could have received two or three, depending on that quantity that they got. And I know that uh, technically they are uh, a one-time use, but I just, I don't know. I know you were at work today, so you didn't see it. I did see on the news today that it can be hung up and you can spray it with Lysol and reuse it again. Yeah, I, I got a question today that the, the, the box said, I think, uh, one day use, but I was told that they were good for three or four days. So we'll, we'll have to look into that. But uh, for most times for the N95 mask, yes, you are correct. They, they are reusable for up to a number of days. Okay. I was just curious if they had yeah. come in yet. Yes. I had known they were coming, but I didn't know when they were coming. Yeah, they've so been thank distributed. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Dr. Ortiz, um, is, this is this presentation going to be 
um, done to principals? Are, is, are they going to be receiving this information? And uh, is appropriate staff going to be very knowledgeable so that they have questions at the school site, they will be able to address them? Yes, I shared a very similar, pres this, similar presentation to this one, Ms. Aragin, with the principals. Uh, I believe they shared them with their staff members this week at their at their staff meeting. Um, and we did, you know, officially begin this process on, on Wednesday. So, uh, and then I, I will meet up, uh, work with Christy Padilla and my division to make sure we uh, meet with the office staff so that they are aware uh, of this process as well. And then I, I uh, gave a brief introduction last week at our DPAC meetings to the uh, Spanish-speaking parents in the morning, the English-speaking parents in the afternoon. Uh, or in the evening uh, about this process. Now, since we didn't begin, I didn't go too much into detail, but there were parents that were aware. Uh, and with in collaboration with uh, Katie, we did sound out a communication on Tuesday or Wednesday, I think. Uh, the days have just, you know, just lumped together, but we did send communication out this week regarding this process and more or less the uh, contain just the general idea of it. Uh, of what how this process would work for them. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I know that you said you you presented to a, a DLAC and stuff. Um, I think too when we need when we um, present things like this to the parents or when we let the parents know, um, and I'm sure you do it, but I just wanted to reiterate it, is that we need to realize we need to let them know when they do presentation or from providing them documents or whatever that is, an email, that we are, you know, following the, the most current guidelines. Because a lot of times, you know, you see on, I see on social media where the parents are saying, oh, now the district's doing it this way, okay? And, you know, and, and we get all because we're changing. We said last week it was 10 days, now it's five days. What's the difference, blah, blah, blah. They, they don't all hear what we hear. They don't all realize that we are making those changes because it is, we're being told to do this by, you know, by the health department. So I think it's important that we, you know, preface all of these kind of things when we're hitting these parents, letting these parents know that there's a reason why we're doing it. We're not just doing it to do it. Yeah, uh, great point, Ms. Otto. A couple of things I, I do, I do blame the state and the, you know, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, but I didn't, we did, we do share that, that these guidelines are based on California Department of Public Health guidelines so that our, our parents, because there is a little bit of frustration, you know, again, change again. And it is even for us as staff to kind of keep on top of all this. So I do make that clear that so that staff doesn't think that it's, it's my idea or your idea or our idea that we are following our guidelines and have been doing that since, since COVID started. So. Mr. Fuentes. Uh, and just to make that clear too, I was in the DLAC meeting that you presented, mm -hmm. and you did make that clear that uh, these aren't our guidelines, they're the board. Mm -hmm. This is what the California Department of Health wants us to do. And uh, I thank you, for Ms. Harrell, for bringing that up too, because yeah. we do need to make make that clear to our parents in our community mm -hmm. that it's not us. Right. It's we're us following direction. So uh, I was at that meeting, and you made that clear. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it is frustrating, I think, for everyone. So just uh, add on a little bit on that. Dr. Ortiz, uh, commend you that last week uh, when it was discussed with our principals, uh, spent a lot of time listening, really listening to their concerns because they're at the front lines uh, implementing these. Uh, and a lot of the 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 adjustment to parents square in the letter was as a result of that, those conversations, mm -hmm. those difficult conversations with our principals and so uh, and I was at that that meeting too and so uh, I just appreciate the fact that you know when these changes come down from the state we really take the time to listen to our uh, people at the at the site who are dealing with these day to day mm -hmm. and and I and and so I as a superintendent you know we, we get hits with so many things but to uh, you know, make the changes and to be flexible. We got rid of the P word, which, you know, uh, <laughs> would be flexible in, in what we do. So we were, uh, the Student Services Division and HR are doing a great job of listening to uh, to our, obviously our community, our parents, but also our, our site principals, admin who are at the ground, 
level, right, at the site level who have to deal with all these questions. And we're trying to and try to make it easier uh, to execute what we're required to execute, which is not easy because of, of all the changes, but it's been simplified as much as we can, I think, uh, in, in graphics and what have you to make it simple for our, our community and for our uh, end users at the end of the day. And so, uh, and then the resources to give the COVID testing, uh, you know, for COVID testing for our community, uh, that is available for all our community folks, employees, free of charge. Uh, and, and so just appreciate the hard work that you guys have done to get that going and rolling that out. And of course the board for approving the, the agreements, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and allowing us to, to uh, reach out and to all these folks anyways. So, yeah, thank you. No, thank you, Dr. Moran. And yeah, just I do want to uh, thank our principals because it, it, we went from our first meeting where lots of concerns and then I met with the elementary group, middle school and then high school group. So I do appreciate their input and honesty. Uh, and they are doing an amazing job. It, it's it's tough at our level, but even tougher at the school side. And they are doing a great job of managing and uh, adapting as necessary. So I do appreciate them. Uh, and also just to piggyback on Antonio, Antonio Castro, uh, Missy and my staff today and uh, Principal Scribner and uh, Dr. Aguilar Munoz. So I inherited a great team from uh, Mr. Dade. Uh, so I'm glad. Yeah, we, we, we do have an amazing staff in student services and PPS. So. Thank Mr. You. Ibarra has a question. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ortiz, for your report. My question is, uh, do, are we also providing all this information to the classified departments, to the heads, so they could share it with their uh, team members? I, yes and no, Mr. Ibarra. I, I did meet in, when the executive cabinet met with uh, our uh, I guess our, our bi-weekly meeting with CSEA, this was shared, uh, but I, have, I haven't specifically met with all the classified managers, but I would be happy to do that to make sure everybody's on the same page. I think that would be an important factor for us so that the whole district is on the same page. I, I will say though that um, it's an expectation that we have, uh, we've let our classified managers know, all the division heads, all the department heads, to put this on their agendas, uh, to address at every department meeting, uh, to discuss. Uh, uh, Tina, uh, Tina, who oversees the largest classified division, uh, you know, that's been something they've discussed to ensure that uh, classified is informed of, especially the, the, I mean, all the changes, but it's been uh, something that we, we expect to, for them to do. Uh, now, uh, and again, um, it, but is it reflective on their minutes for their meetings that they do for, uh, for uh, accountability? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. That's something that uh, you know we could we could check to ensure that that that's happening. We have to uh, again, um, it's not I something that we can take a look at and, and ensure that you know, that they're documenting that they're having these conversations because, uh, again, like I said, uh, it is something that I've uh, directed our division heads, our assistant soups, our departments to say, these uh, have to be on your agendas. So uh, I haven't looked at any specific uh, department minutes, but certainly I can, uh, we can take a look at that and verify that that's happening. Well, the point is, is that are we requesting for them to document at all? We're requesting for, for them to, for put, yeah. Accountability, uh, for liability, yeah. for any of those? I, I, uh, we're asking them to put it on their agenda so that would uh, meet that um, requirement. And, uh, but we have a check to see if they're actually doing it. I, I will check with my assistant superintendents, and, and uh, so we'll follow up on that. Now, just to be fair among all our employees, mm -hmm. to make sure that they get the message across, I think that's important. I would hate to have anyone approach us saying that they were not informed. Yeah, well, absolutely, Mr. Ibarra. I will make sure that I follow up with uh, our CSCA group. And, and, and just to, Thank you. in terms of information and communication, because I think you bring up a, a great point, 
uh, is that uh, our communication department, uh, and Ms. Orloff, has sent out quite a bit of communication to all our employees. Uh, all communication in terms of the changes for the Cal OSHA uh, gets sent out to all employees. Uh, so we have that uh, as evidence. We also have uh, the, the uh, training uh, that exists that we that's required of our employees uh, through our ASKIP. Uh, if there's trainings there, so that protects us from liability of the usage of not only masks but understanding the virus. So there's a, a set of of uh, trainings that's uh, required of our employees too. So that. There is a lot of information that's going out to them. Uh, and sometimes, honestly, well, uh, sometimes we, we try to be careful with too much information, but in these days, things change so rapidly that we're we're having to send out, you know, I think there's not a week that doesn't go by that uh, Katie doesn't send something out regarding uh, uh, what, what's going on with these changes. So well, that part I don't doubt. As far as going out, I'm just looking at, you know, is it being implemented? Is it actually being done? Because it's been my experience over the years. If, if it's not in writing, it never happens. And, uh, you know, we could say we gave, but I wanted to verify whether they're actually doing it. No other questions? Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Our next administrative presentation is item 4.3. This is the late start bill 2022-23. And this is, um, again, Dr. Ortiz and Ms. Kingston from Student Services Division. Yes, good evening, Board for, uh, President Aragin, Board Members, Dr. Miranda. I just want to introduce Missy Kingston. She's going to be speaking about the late start bill. Uh, good evening, Board President Aragin. Board members, Superintendent Miranda, Executive Cabinet members of the audience. My name is Missy Kingston, the Director of Student Services, and I'm happy to share some information about the Late Start Bill that will come into play next year. Next slide, please. So Senate Bill 328 amended Education Code 46148, and what it says is that beginning July 1st of 22, middle schools can begin no earlier than 8 a.m., and high school can begin no earlier than 8.30. Next slide, please. So with knowing that we must adhere to the Ed Code and to the Senate bill, we looked at this as also an opportunity for alignment across our, our levels of elementary, middle, and high school. So we want more continuity and alignment since we know we're gonna have to make some changes anyway. And those are things like common start times, minimum days aligned across the levels, and this needs to be in place by next year. Next slide, please. So, so far, some action steps. Uh, we've met with the Transportation Department to discuss routes, start and end times, um, different options. We've developed a comprehensive late start committee, and I'm going to go into that in just a few slides. Um, and that involves members from across the district. And ultimately, we ended up, after gathering information, contracting with a company called TransFinder to establish some possible routes and start and end times for the district and give us some options to look at. Next slide, please. So who's part of this committee? We have over 90 members of this committee, um, and we really wanted to get a wide range of persons involved in this so that we could think of every possible impact that this uh, change to our start times is going to have. Um, on our community. So we've got teachers from all levels. We have athletic directors, counselors, our classified staff, our site administrators. We have our union representatives, think together. Um, executive cabinet is on that committee and multiple departments from, from the district, uh, transportation, nutrition services, language support, IT, MNO, um, ed services, pretty much it's across the district because it will affect all of us. Next slide, please. So in terms of meeting, <clears throat> our main um, objective at the beginning was really to discuss, okay, we, we know that we're gonna have to look at finding some options for start times and what does that look like by changing the high school, it's gonna affect start times for elementary, et cetera, and really starting to gather all of the potential impacts that these changes are gonna have. And that has been crucial for our committee. We have had so much feedback from people um, 
discussing all types of possible impacts. Now, we won't be planning around those impacts quite yet until we determine what exact start times we're gonna have for next year. Um, so right now it's really looking at what are those potential impacts. We've discussed options that were provided by TransFinder related to the start and end times and minimum days and brainstormed possible areas, peoples, processes, et cetera, that, is, that are gonna be affected by these changes. Next slide, please. Uh, things that we considered in terms of um, the impacts, in addition to start and end times, we know that we must comply with the required instructional minutes. We looked at minimum day. Our committee discussed how this will affect zero, seventh, and eighth periods. Uh, we know it will impact students and parents and families. It'll affect staff because some people will change their, their start and end times of their work days. Transportation routes are definitely affected, late buses, overflow students, uh, community members may be impacted. So things like facilities use, if school's getting out later, that pushes everything back in terms of community use of our facilities. We know it will impact athletics, intramurals, practices, extracurricular activities, co-curricular, things like that. Um, there'll be potential impact to think together in our, our um, after school and possibly before school programs, nutrition services, our master scheduling facilities, including lighting and, and things along that nature. Um, we talked about how this may impact staff meeting time, collaboration time for our, um, our staff members, tutoring, et cetera. Um, our committee has done an amazing job really trying to think of what are all the potential impacts that we're gonna have to plan around. So. I, I really want to take this opportunity to thank everybody that was, has been part of this committee uh, because it is a large group and to get that many people together and have all of that impact where we're all kind of thinking outside the box of what could potentially be impacted um, is amazing. So uh, publicly wanted to thank everyone that's participated. Next slide, please. Our next steps is we will continue to meet with the committee um, to discuss those start and end times questions, concerns, the impacts, and start to plan for those changes. And we'd really like to come back to you at the February 17th board meeting to provide some options for the board for consideration, guidance, and direction. Uh, the committee, believe it or not, with 90 plus people did come to a consensus on a couple of the options that TransFinder did provide to us that we think will best meet the needs of everyone in general, our, our community, our students, um, the start times for all different levels. So. Um, that has been forwarded over to Executive Cabinet. They're going to look at that information and we'd love to bring that back to you uh, at the February 17th board meeting. Next slide, please. Are there any questions? Questions from the board? Hey, Mr. Ibarra. Hello, Missy, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the report. My question is basically, uh, what is the time frame? that we're going to be required as a district uh, to make a decision and notify the parents uh, prior to the next school year? So we want to notify everyone as soon as possible. That's why um, we literally got new information from TransFinder this week. Uh, we met with the committee on Tuesday and took the latest options to them, which were, were very feasible. And uh, when we come back next, next board meeting, you'll see there's some considerations that we have to look at is not just the start times, but the feasibility of those start times. So we only have a certain amount of, of buses. And so we need to look at what possible routes can we have as, as close as we can get to start times that we feel are appropriate, right? We don't want our school starting at 915 or something like that. We wanna look at alignment. We wanna look at how can we make this the best for everyone? And then there'll be some decisions like if, if there's a start time that requires more buses, do we purchase buses? Do we have, if, even if we wanted to do that, would we get them in time? So there's a lot of considerations to make. So when we bring this back, we're, we would really love to get as much uh, direction from the board at the next board meeting so we can start informing parents, start planning for all the impacts that whatever the decision is for the start times will have notify our employees because it will be changes for everyone and change is hard. Everyone's been through a lot of change the last couple of years and we know families uh, will be impacted by this. So we would like to get it out as soon as possible. And Mr. Um, Yabara, if I could uh, continue to answer and support missing a response. So the requirement is that we implement by July 1st, 
But to answer your question, we'd love to start notifying parents in the communities in March. So right after that Fe February 17th board meeting, after we received direction from you and, and our board members, we'd like to start messaging so that way people can start to think about those adjustments that they may need to make. Uh, being a bill, uh, uh, as it is constructed and what we're going to be required to do, are, are we going to be in a position to have to maybe uh, meet with parents, do community uh, parent meetings? Uh, is that something you foresee that, you know, this district might need to do to answer any questions? Uh, as we find out with COVID, we're going to also realize that many parents are going to think it's a decision the district's making. Uh, you know, and which is not. What's your thoughts on that? We can definitely create a virtual option where parents, like we did in, in the past, where they can, you know, weigh in on and give us some options that are giving us their opinions or things that may impact them in a negative or positive way. So, yes, we can create that uh, meeting for parents to provide some input. Okay, thank you. Board Member Flores. Thank you. I just want to touch on a question that Board Member Ibarra uh, mentioned. Uh, the list of every, all the stakeholders, fantastic. A lot of people on that list. What I didn't see on the list were parents. <laughs> so here I'm going to put my parent hat on. Um, because there's a lot of talking to parents and informing parents. I'm hearing that. What I'm not hearing is we're asking parents for their feedback because there's two things that impact parents tremendously in the school district. Number one, when you start and end school, because we've got to make arrangements to pick them up or have grandma and grandpa pick them up or Theo and Thea or whomever. And the other thing is, and I've mentioned this before, is when we decide to obviously have you know, our breaks in the school year, a three week break in the winter as opposed to a two week break um, for many parents is a challenge when it comes to childcare. That's another issue to discuss another time. But again, when I ask the question, do we ask parents how those decisions impact them, I don't think we really do. This is one of those instances where I think we have to get feedback from parents. Parents work in our district um, and their ability to get their kids to school on time, uh, make sure they get picked up safely. Uh, granted, our hands are somewhat tied in the sense that the state's already laid out what we have to do. But I do think, as Mr. Barr alluded to, we have to engage parents in this process. And now really is the time to do it. Um, Keeping those start times as close together, particularly for the elementaries, I think is really important. We have a disparity right now in start times at elementary. The schools in Bloomington start really late. And not only does that impact um, the cycle for the teachers and the staff, but it impacts their ability to go to an ACE meeting that happens at you know, 2.45 or 3 o'clock or whatever. And all the teachers on this side of the district that don't get out until 3.30 or 4 o'clock can't make those meetings. So. It needs to be there needs to be parity and equity for our staff as well and and um, not a disadvantage to teaching in a school in a certain part of the district because they start 45 minutes later or an hour later than everyone else. So um, I know we'll have that conversation that's being looked at, but I just have to reiterate as a, as a parent, um, we have to you know, I, it's difficult for me to say that we're going to make a decision without in some way, shape or form soliciting input, feedback, a survey, considerations. Uh, even if it's using existing parent groups that we have, and we have a lot of them already in the district, but considerations. And I know that making sure that um, that start time is, it coincides with their ability to get to work is a big one. Because we have, you know, our households are two parent working households oftentimes. And I can tell you, I see a lot of grandparents doing a lot of drop off and pick up. And, and that's great. But um, that feedback is really important. So, Thank you. Mr. Fuentes. Yes, I think you mentioned the, on the buses. If we do make it, when we make our decision uh, at the next board meeting, will be will we be able to get buses, new buses, if we need to, in time for the next school? Or is that a big, big? Uh, That's something we'd have to look at. It, to be quite honest, look at that because if some of our routes are going to get changed because of the late start you really need to get on that and, uh, and i think uh, also on the parent i was going to ask the same question about the parents and i think that's something we really need to get on too uh, i'm just concerned because it's not like uh, we need to get students from a B, you know so uh, yeah yes well whatever recommendation options we provide the board will be what's feasible with what we 
have. And then again, you know, oh, change is change is hard. We got to implement this, but but it will be based on what we currently have the resources we have. We're not going to propose something that it will be uh, not we're not able to do. So based on you know, we're not going to do something that requires us to add like 15, 20 buses. That's just not going to happen. But if it's one or two buses, that it, that's feasible. So we're looking at those options, but based on what we currently have. We have a robust bus system in our district. We provide great transportation, so there. We I think we will will uh, once we get even current input, you'll the board will see that the options are uh, will be I think uh, and, will make that, sense. And that's so. understandable. I'm, I'm sure. just saying, you know, even even if we can order a couple of buses now, mm -hmm. maybe two or three, because eventually we're going to need to change them out older ones if they're anything but yeah. great, you know kind of get ahead of ourselves a little bit just just to have that precaution because we don't want students to you know and parents to have to deal with trying to figure out how to get their student to the school or not to the school but you know like it's not not 10 or 15 buses but maybe two or three buses on order just for that uh, reason of making sure that our students have the chance Transportation. Uh, our, our transportation department and fiscal uh, has a replacement of buses, uh, so we have it in our budget. And not only that, but we're asking um, uh, community members uh, to to maybe assist us with that. So cool. I think that's a great point. Awesome. Thank great you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hart. Well, I'm just going to, the first thing I'm going to say is I just love how the assembly passes a bill with no, with <laughs> With, it's not saying that here, here's some money to help you do this, or uh, this, you know, they, they just, they didn't even, uh, you know, even like our local assembly, nobody came to us and said, how is this going to impact you if we pass this bill? They just passed it, and we're left, you know, footing the bill and having to make it work. Okay, so that's my, uh, that was my first soapbox thing, because nobody said anything about that, but that just ticks me off. Anyway, um, I, I like that uh, board member Flores brought up about uh, parental uh, uh, involvement, so to speak. Um, I think we need to do maybe like some virtual meetings like uh, English, Spanish, letting the parents, uh, because if letting them know what's coming down, what's happening, because um, as you said, they have to arrange for that, you know, later start okay uh, you know most parents who have to go into work if they don't work locally they have to drive to work and they're already struggling to get their kids to school or on time and now it's going to be even later and they have to arrange for all of that and uh again just like the last topic we were talking about they need to you know because there's a lot of parents out there who, who don't follow uh what's going down with the you know, the governor or the legislature or whatever, and they're going to think, oh, Colton's making another change. No, it's not us. <laughs> you know, it is it is the state is telling us what to do and we have to do it. They need to know that. They need, you know, for the ones that don't know it, because I, I bet you there's a ton of them who don't even know that this bill passed and that we have to do it. So we need to let them know that this is not Colton Joint Unified. This is going to be every district then the state has to do it. So they have to realize that. So do we don't get the fallback that says, well, I'm gonna send my kid to another district because you know, I don't wanna to have to do this with my child. They need to know these things. So I think it's really prudent that we have these virtual meetings. And the key is how are we gonna get the message out about those virtual meetings? Cause you know, there's a handful, I don't know how many parents, but they don't all go look at the website. And you always see on social media, oh, the district is sending another text, or the district is calling again. And when we call with a message from the school or the call, you know, that my child's school, oh, it's Colton, and they hang up the phone. They don't even listen to the to the what the message is. So I don't know what the best way to let them know. Um, maybe when we're going to have these virtual meetings, have posters up at the site. At the, at the school site when they're picking up their parent, the kids, maybe handing out flyers. I don't know what it is, but we need to let these parents know what is happening with this 
and that it's not just a Colton issue. So um, that's my two cents. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, and I will add to, you know, with uh, to, to board member Harl's uh, comment is, you know, as, as this, you know, the weeks came by, I kept thinking, really? They're really doing this? And I thought, no, they can't be, you know, they can't be serious, but it looks like it is going to happen and we have to, you know, do what we have to do. Um, again, adding to the parent concerns that have already been shared, um, I'm, I, my concern is, you know, yes, we're, you know, at our next board meeting, we're going to be, you know, looking at options. Um, and but like board member Harrell said, uh, parents need to know not the detailed plan, but just in flashing lights, like it's coming. And, and say late, and this is what it is, late start bill 2022-23, just saying, hey, this is the bill, it's coming. Because that way, the parents' mindset's already known. Instead of waiting until we roll out their, our plan and saying, what? You know, so uh, anything we can do to just flash some lights and say, it's coming. This is what it is. More deep, more information will come. I mean, that's just my, my concern. We can do that. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Missy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, well, we are moving on to our action items. We have items 5.1 through 5.29. Um, uh, we, uh, we do have 5.2 that will be pulled separate for separate consideration to allow board member Sandoval to abstain. Other than that, do we have any other items to be considered separately? If not, um, I would like to, uh, let's see, okay, we need a motion to approve items 5.1, okay, 5.14 and 5.15, okay, okay, I need a motion to approve action items 5.1, 5.3 through 5.13, 5.16 .5 through 5.29. Okay, Haro, Ms. Board Member Haro, and Mr. Fuentes, okay. I have a motion by Board Member and second by board member Fuentes to approve action items 5.1, 5 5.3 5 through 5.13, 5.16 through 5.29. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Nays? Okay, on more um, motion of board member Haro and board member Fuentes and carried on a 7-0 vote. The board approved items, uh, action items 5.1 through 5.1 and then 5.3 through 13, 5.16 through 29. Okay, of course with the exception of 5.2 and 5.14 and 5.15. Okay. Action item 5.2. Adoption of resolution for the compensation for missed meeting for, um, for board member Sandoval. Okay, I need a motion to approve item 5.2. So okay, by Mr. Ibarra. And second, by Mr. Fuentes. To approve action item 5.2. All in favor? Aye. Nays? And abstentions? Okay, Ms. Sandoval. Okay. A motion by board member Ibarra and second and board member Fuentes and carried on a 7 0 vote. Um, the board approved action item 5.2 with board member Sandoval abstaining. Okay. okay, now we are going back to 5.14. 5.14? Okay. You move to approve 5.14. Okay. 
Okay, board member Haro uh, moves to approve 5.14 and 5.15. We have a second. Well, second. Okay, second by Mr. Ibarra. Okay, uh, any discussion? Um, I think my point is, um, you know, I know that we need these Chromebooks for our kids and everything. I realize that don't have a problem approving the item, but is it, this is not something that we, um, I've asked before and I still never really have gotten an answer, is that um, I noticed that all of our um, Chromebooks, everything, we go buy from one vendor. And is this not something that we go out to bid for? Is it, do we have a, or is it a piggyback? Is it a, what is it? Why are we always buying? I just want to know why we always buy from one vendor and that we don't, isn't it something that we, you know? Yeah, yeah I appreciate the question. Uh, I think uh, you brought this uh, up, uh, Ms. Haro, uh, in the past. And I know that the IT department goes through a vetting process and also uh, through CMS and, and bids and things like that. Uh, there, uh, we are we are always looking at other vendors to give us best pricing uh, and and you know white glove service. I think that the vendor bridge one does provide that. Uh, and so, uh, however, uh, I know that talking to Dr. Peterson and, and IT, uh, we are looking at other vendors. Uh, and uh, as a new director starts, that's one of the priorities is to how do we uh, not just stick with one, but uh, how do we, you know, get other vendors to be part of the bidding process to get us to uh, not only competitor, competitive price, but uh, it, it is uh, something that we've been we've been really looking at uh, and uh, something that I've directed staff to to really consider. And so, uh, yes, I, yeah, I know, so I know that normally, like when we bid out, you know, we'll show mm -hmm. like. You know, this one bid right. this much, and this one bid this much, and you know the the amount, and then this is why we're going with this company, yeah, their service and the price, you know, or whatever. And and I just I just wanted to know because right. um, we spend a lot of money on technology as we should for our students, but I just want to make sure, you know, are we getting the best deal? Why are why do we keep going back to the same company? What, what's going on? So okay, thank you. So we're moving forward with uh, uh, with this these two items. I have a motion by Board Member Haro and second by Board Member Ibarra to approve 5.14 and 5.15. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. On motion by Board Member Haro and Board Member Ibarra. Um, and carried on a 7-0 vote. The board approved item 5.14 and 5.15. Moving on to administrative reports. Okay, we have uh, administrative, re uh, administrative reports 6.1 and 6.2. Let's start with 6.1, approved disbursements. Do we have any questions or concerns from board members? Okay. Item 6.2, the 2020-2021 Independent Auditors Annual Financial Audit Report, and I, um, we did get a copy of, these, of this report. Um, and, and we do have uh, the auditor present here in the audience. So are there any questions or comments from board members? If not, we'll go ahead and uh, and thank you for, for being here. Um, and I believe we do not have questions at this time. Then thank you for the report. Okay, six point three facility updates. We do not have a facility update this evening. Item six point four. We have our eighth president, Parachi, presenting. Good evening. Nagili presenting, just talking. <laughs> Good evening, esteemed board members, um, Superintendent Mirada, cabinet members, and members of the audience. My name is Christina Poraci, and I have the privilege to serve as the president of the Association of Colton Educators. 
I'm happy to see that there is an update on COVID plan. And thank you, Mr. Daide, for putting in a flowchart. I'm sure you are tired of hearing about flowcharts. Um, but I am hoping that there will be printed copies available to be posted in the staff lounge and everywhere that staff uh, can see. So uh, eliminate a little bit of the questions and, and confusions. We are also hoping that soon the board that has such a beautiful, clean uh, shield will make a decision about those shields uh, in the classroom. Um, subbing has been an issue since we returned. Everyone has been subbing, including myself. I have been pushing for resident subs, inviting retired teachers to return. However, I am not happy with the progress in both areas. I am working with Mr. Dade on that to improve um, and uh, solve these issues in, in the limitations that we have. I am asking and working uh, on um, this issue that I'm gonna talk next to Dr. Peterson to modify some of the collaboration days for teachers and to just give them time to work on teacher-driven agenda. Since everyone is subbing during the uh, planning time and most of the teachers are having split classrooms and they have extra students in the class daily. So um, I think I kind of alluded to this last board meeting um, and I haven't seen anything done yet. I am working with Dr. Peterson to see how that can be solved until the uh, subbing issues, uh, it's a little bit alleviated. Thank you for approving the 2022, 2023 and 2023 and 2024 calendar. Um, it's official now, so I, um, I'm hoping that the parents will uh, be informed and um, everybody can plan vacations. Um, today was a little different. Um, I did observe the fast response, the crisis team and support staff included one of the school board members that they provided to the school in need. I enjoyed uh, uh, Antonio's uh, presentation and uh, learning and hearing about the wellness centers I do have a question. Um, when will we see a wellness center at Slover? Um, that is a school that has probably the most neediest of our students in our population. ACE, district office and CSEA are working on a lot of um, projects. I meet regularly with assistant superintendents and directors for problem solving, but at this time, Negotiations are a priority for the association. Um, as you remember, since the sunshine ended sometimes in November, I've been asking the board to give the district bargaining team directive. Uh, I'm coming back to you to ask you that you follow to and give the district a bargaining team directions. Um, it is February, it's late. Most of the districts around us are done negotiating. So um, please give the district directive and guidance on what could happen at the table. Um, we would, ACE's goal is to be done by April. And I know I, I said the same thing last time because this way it will give you time to approve, will give us time to TA and start. And I know um, board member Haro, she always asks, we should be done by June. So this way we could potentially be done by June. So with that, board members, thank you for all your support. Um, Executive Cabinet, thank you for um, always being, being willing to meet and discuss. And uh, I have long, long agendas and they we always go over time. We never really finish in an hour that we settle, but um, things are getting done. It's just hard when everybody's in the classroom subbing and other things uh, end up to be put on the back burden. So um, with that, thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you so much. Item 6.5, CSEA. I do not see a representative from CSEA. Oh, no. MAC update. No MAC update. ROP update. No update. No update. Item 7.1, superintendents communicate. I do have a communique this evening. I'm trying to make it short. <laughs> uh, so 
we'll start with the first uh, slide. Uh, and and by the way, good evening, uh, Board President Flores. Yes, <laughs> is there no? That's not a that's not Sorry. a typo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So it's going to take a little time to get used to, but it's Board Member Board President <laughs> Flores. Uh, distinguished board members, uh, members of the audience. Uh, you know, I wanted to start off with the, the first slide and just something that really, um, that really thrills me and, and very exciting that we are starting with our TELUS present program. So we can get to that. There we go. Beautiful. I, this, is, this is extremely exciting because five years ago or something like that, we had a vision in this district to talk. Uh, we talked about telepresence. Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Almendaris and I, we worked on this about five years ago when I was the CBO. I worked on the budgeting for it, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> and so th this was a vision uh, that, that we had and that, honestly, just to give all the credit to Mr. Almendaris, uh, it was his vision. Of course, I'm going to take credit for him now because I'm the superintendent <laughs> and, he, and he's gone. But uh, the board approved tonight the MOU with ACE uh, so we could start this. Uh, in support of telepresent courses for our honors digital electronics and uh, introduction to engineering design between Grand Terrace High School uh, and Bloomington High Schools. So there's going to be a, a synergy and a, and a collaboration there. So this is the time that, uh, you know, at this time we're going to start this pilot program, the telepresence courses. Uh, it, and it really is about ensuring that all the students in our district uh, have access uh, to the necessary career technical ed uh, education courses uh, to complete their pathways. So that's really our focus. And our vision statement, uh, it, it's pretty extensive, but it talks about this. So this is making our vision a reality, which is extremely exciting. And I know our board members, a lot of our board members here, this is dear near to their heart because career technical education is not only the future, but it is the now. And so I'm really excited about this. Uh, when I saw this, and I just said, wow, this is amazing. Uh, so we're using our Promethean boards that the board approved a while back to get them all in all our classrooms, along with our Cisco cameras, speakers. Uh, obviously, you can't do it without teachers. So we, we have some amazing teachers that are, are going to be able to uh, teach at one site and uh, support students at another site and engage them in this in this uh, learning. This is, uh, the like I said, the... This is the 22nd century learning uh, redesign model, if you will. Uh, this is only a pilot program, uh, so I want to thank uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Wallace from Grand Terrace High School for uh, who are going to be doing the uh, instruction. Uh, and so Mr. Johnson's at uh, Grand Terrace High School, and I believe Mr. Wallace is at Bloomington High School. So they're going to be providing the support to multiple classes, uh, class periods, which includes Obviously, they're going to provide the instruction, the grading, and other, and provide, uh, you know, everything a teacher does, which is uh, a huge responsibility. Uh, and uh, so you have one teacher in one classroom, you have a teacher in another classroom. Uh, and so it's going to be very exciting to, to watch this happen. Uh, and so the telepresent classes uh, and, and, um, are going to start, and, you know, they're starting, with, starting in second semester. And uh, they're, they're happening. Uh, I've been in Mr. Johnson's engineering class at Grand Terrace High School. It's an amazing environment for kids. Uh, there, there's so many great things happening uh, there that I'm just blown away. So it's very exciting to see him explore this program through this uh, vehicle, if you will, through technology. So it's just, just great, uh, great opportunity here. Um, another thing that I want to highlight tonight, next slide, please. Is our Bloomington High School virtual enterprise uh, team. Uh, if you don't know about our virtual enterprise, uh, they are amazing. I've, I've had the uh, privilege uh, for many years to go in there and talk to the students, visit them, and get to know them. And Ms. Buckles there does a phenomenal job, the team there. Uh, so uh, I think all of you know, but I'll repeat it again, that, uh, and it was it's stated tonight by our, our Bloomington High students. Uh, that uh, there uh, we had a uh, case of armor right uh, their business plan uh, was uh, was a winner and they moved into the final eight teams within California which is extremely exciting and have security spot uh, compete to compete nationally in New York City in April 
So once again, our Bloomington High students uh, have exceeded our expectations, but in actuality, I think we expect this now because they, they do this often, you know, so it's great. It's like back to back, just keep going, you guys. Uh, but we're extremely proud of them. You know, they have a lot of obstacles. They don't have a lot of the resources. Uh, so we're just extremely proud, especially during COVID. Uh, doing this virtual is not easy, as everybody knows. And, and you know, uh, so they, they've been able to work hard and it's paid off. So congratulations to our BHS virtual enterprise team, Case of Armor. So, and they're up there on the screen. Extremely professional. Again, if you ever talk to these, and we've had them present here at the board, uh, and they're they're just um, inspirational. Uh, so we we, uh, we 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 really love them. And then um, the last slide, uh, hashtag CGSD cares. Uh, just you know, we have a lot of heroes in our district. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our school lunch heroes, the ladies who provide the lunch to our kids, uh, and so. Uh, our amazing nutrition services team has this uh, contest uh, that students can submit a 30 to second video of appreciation uh, in, in for their uh, or either their lunch lady or their food dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now the deadline to submit the video is April 15th. Uh, and so visit social media for the contest details. Uh, and, and so on behalf of the Board of Education and Executive Cabinet, we want to thank all of our nutrition service heroes, heroes, because they are, uh, for all that they do to ensure students receive lunch. They do it with a smile uh, and, you know, sincerely. They, they were, they've been there since through all the COVID, uh, just like our security team and, and on and on uh, to, to provide these services that we know are amazing. And, you know, we're a, a CEP district, meaning all our students receive breakfast, lunch for free, 100%. So we we, uh, we want to thank our heroes for, for doing what they do. And so students, uh, if you're listening or parents, uh, you know, it'd be nice to, to send a little video to them. They would appreciate it uh, and thanking them. And our social media feeds are up. I mean, I just, I wanted to shout that out too. Uh, they, they've triple quadrupled. I mean, so uh, if uh, if you haven't not started following Colton, you see all the wonderful things that are happening on our on our Facebook, Twitter uh, pages, Instagram. Uh, it, it just is just it's pretty amazing. So with that, uh, Board President, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Miranda. Okay, moving on to board member comments. I would like to start with board member Thoring Ojeda. Okay. Board member Ibarra. Thank you, Bertha. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, taking this opportunity to thank our security department, our administration, and, and staff for uh, what uh, they had to deal with this morning at uh, Joe Baca, Ruth O'Harris, and Grant Terrace. Um, when I hear from our superintendent that uh, there's a potential incident that may occur uh, just like uh, what was transpiring. Part of me has a lot of concern for staff, our students, our community. But then there's another part of me that gives me a little bit of security because knowing the individuals that are involved in providing a safe, secure environments for our students and our staff uh, gives me a really good feeling. Uh, Dr. Miranda talking about heroes. I think that uh, we are in a very good position as a district to take a look at throughout our district, throughout our departments, and we could find a variety of different type of heroes within our Cone Joint Unified School District family. So I just want to say thank you, uh, Mr. Sachs, to you and your your department, your staff, to our administration, to Dr. Miranda. Um, I know that we 
are in great hands because we have utmost professionals in, in every one of the departments that we have. Another great indication of that, it was uh, uh, one of our report earlier by Mr. Castro, uh, having a Department of Behavior Health, and for some of you who don't know, I spent about 20 years of my career working for the County Department of Behavior Health. I ran and created programs for them. Um, and talking about the, the value that they bring to our district for our students uh, during this difficult period of time. And uh, it, it's just like my colleague said earlier, it's just worth so much. Um, and I think that that's another area that we could be very, very proud of. Uh, the, the hindsight, the foresight to, to develop such a program, to bring that in. Um, I think that uh, we have been very fortunate to have such a great program like that in place here in our district. And one of the things that I would encourage is that we need to let all the parents know, uh, all the staff knows. Um, at this particular point in time, I, I'm ending my career in education, I'm teaching. And because of that, uh, I know how important uh, our teachers are in our district, another group of heroes. Um, it's not, not known that teachers are caretakers, they're educators, they're advocates. They do a variety of different jobs within the scope of their job duties and more. And because now that we have a solid growing behavioral health program, it provides our teachers and our staff with additional resources to help our students and to take some pressure and relief off our individual teachers as well. They have somewhere they could go, which is wonderful. So I know that there's a lot of other departments that do wonderful jobs, really appreciate what they do. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight uh, the ones that I did today, our, our security, our administration, our mental health services, um, as they uh, continue to provide a wonderful service to all our students and, and staff in our community. So thank you to you all for that. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Ibarra. Board Member Flores. Board Member Fuentes. Thank you, Board President. Uh, first of all, like Mr. Ibarra said, I want to thank uh, our safety team this uh, morning. I had the opportunity to go out there at Joe Baca this morning. I actually geared up and put on my vest and went out there to assist them any way I could. Uh, and I want to thank also the mutual aid that we received from Rialto PD, uh, from uh, the Sheriff's Department for coming out there and uh, helping our safety department, uh, making sure that our campus was clear of any dangers. And. Uh, I, I think we have a great mutual aid with our local PDs in Fontana, like in Rialto, like in Colton, uh, with our Sheriff's Department from the county. And uh, I want to applaud each and every one of them for being there. I, I, I kid you not, there was a great presence of uh, officers there making sure that our students were safe. Our safety department was out there in full gear, walking, looking at things, asking questions. And at the same time, was at Ruth O'Harris doing the same thing. So I commend you, uh, Director uh, Sachs, for your team. Please, please let them know that we really appreciate what they do on a daily basis on keeping our campus safe. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, Mr. Castro for coming out and bringing his team out to comfort those students, to make uh, comfort our staff and students, make sure they were feeling okay, everything was fine. 
Uh, like I said earlier, he was out there speaking to parents with uh, one of our counselors was out there and the, while the parents were picking up some of their kids. Some parents did pick up their kids this evening, that evening, that morning, excuse me. And he was out there asking questions, making sure everyone was okay. So we have a great, phenomenal team, crisis team here at Colton Joint Unified. And my hat off to you. I applaud you for the great, great work that each and every one of you do. Please let your staff know. Please let them know that we really appreciate them very much. And I know that, uh, Col you know, CJUSD cares. We care. We care for our students. No matter who, what anybody says, we care for them. We care for our staff. We care for everyone in our communities that our schools are in. So thank you once again for the quick response. Like I said, I was there and I saw it. And I also want to thank Dr. Scribner, uh, uh, principal of uh, Joe Baca, Ms. Villegas, also who's the assistant principal and the staff for also doing a great, phenomenal job of making sure that the students were safe and that the students were kept calm, and not to say our teachers, the other heroes, as Mr. Ivana said. They are our heroes for keeping the students in, in, in place, keeping them uh, calm. I am pretty sure that some of them were still teaching them when they were in lockdown and, and talking to them. So very, very much appreciative. And I know that this will continue from now and forever, even when we're not around. You know, the legacies of many of our leadership currently will continue. And uh, once again, thank you. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you for keeping our students safe. Also on another note, talking about safety, uh, I know I've been uh, in conversation with uh, Mr. Miranda about getting some more units and maybe starting a, a, a day patrol and an evening patrol, but that's another thing that we will eventually be talking about. Also, a PSA announcement for Mr. Fuentes here. I've also been driving around the schools in the morning for drop-off and in the errands. Please, please be safe when you're driving, dropping off your child. I've seen some, um, some amazing things go on when you're dropping off your kid. I've seen them drop them off in the middle of the street. They cross, they don't look both ways, almost get run over, especially our little ones. Parents, make the time to drop off your child. Do not double park, do not triple park. You know, it's each and every one of us's responsibility, I think that was a word, our responsibility to keep our children safe when we drop them off and when we pick them up. I was at some of the sites uh, during the morning, and it, it was scary to see some of the things that were going on. Some of the siblings, I would say brothers and sisters and uh, cousins that pick up your primos and you pick up your brother and sister, and you have these amazing cars. Remember, 25 miles an hour, not 75 miles an hour. Some of these things are happening at Bloomington High School, especially back in the stadium area, where I got a I got a car with whatever horsepower and let me show it off. It's not time to show it off. There's buses in the back picking up kids. There's parents in the back, other people picking up kids. Let's use some common sense, young people. Let's use some common sense. It is. Your responsibility, like it's our responsibility to make sure that your brother and sister, your primo, your friend, whoever you pick up, makes it home safely. Please, use some common sense. Parents, use some common sense. It is our responsibility, again, all of us, to make sure that your child gets to school safely and that your child gets home safely. We care for them. We want to make sure that they, they, they do. You know, I see things, I sometimes have to look at people and uh, I'm amazed to see some of the things that happen. U-turns, illegal U-turns in the middle of the street. I mean, people don't, don't keep an eye out. Some students are crossing the street, almost get hit. The crosswalks, 
please, if you see a cross guard out there with the stop sign that says stop, stop. You see the buses turn on their lights and the sign comes out and it says stop, stop. You know, again, our responsibility. You never know what can happen in any second. Please, you know, from the bottom of my heart as a board member, and I know my colleagues are there also, you know, I don't want to be a, sitting here one day or receive a text message from our superintendent that we've had an issue at one of the schools because of people driving erratically. Please, please. I'm not here to point fingers or anything, but I'm here to just make sure that let's be cautious. Let's be very cautious out there. You know, I care for the kids. I have a, a student at Bloomington High School. You know, she's a sophomore and I care for her like I care for every single child in this district. All 24,000 of them. Not to say our staff. Please. Have a great evening. God bless you. We'll see you at the next one. Board Member Sandoval. Board Member Harrell. Well, you know, I have something to say all the time. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to talk about the good stuff first. Um, I know that Superintendent Miranda already talked about the virtual enterprise, but it does bear, bear repeating. Uh, they're in the final eight of the state and they're going to New York. Again, I mean, that is tremendous. The second team e-compact e at Bloomington High School, uh, while not going to New York, they were in the final 16. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that up because Miss um, Buckles and they are doing a, doing a tremendous job, tremendous job, and students love the program. Um, I also wanted to uh, just, you brought up the telepresence program, and I remember, I believe it was like, five years ago, maybe six years ago, a group of 30 of us went up to uh, Silicon Valley and <laughs> stayed in some really dicey hotels <laughs> because the hotels were so expensive in Silicon Valley. Uh, yeah, do you remember that? I didn't go. Oh, you didn't go? <laughs> oh, yeah, there were little critters in our hotel and stuff. Yeah, because the hotels were so expensive. And we were only staying one night, so we, you know, but anyway, um, but there were 30 of us, there were teachers, I know, ed services, there was uh, IT, there were so many people who had uh, input in this happening. And we were so impressed with it on how we could uh, make it work for our students that uh, Cisco at the time said that they wanted to bring up students to talk to them about it. And um, then it was, uh, it was not feasible for them to bring the students up to Cisco up in Sa San Jose. So instead we took bus a bus and the same group of 30 adults and the kids from the three high schools went down to Irvine, to Cisco in Irvine. And the kids got to see how this would work. Um, unfortunately, we didn't, we bought. We ended up agreeing and bought, bought the the, uh, uh, the the necessary equipment to do the telepresence. And I know that Mrs. Duckworth used it when she was uh, during last year. She was using it to present a, a, a band concert of all the kids, and and they used the equipment to do it. But we hadn't used it in the way it was meant to be done until now because of the need. And I just think this is, I, I'm, I'm thinking finally we're using it the way it was meant to be used, but I'm also thinking how great what this is going to do for our students. It's going to give them even more access uh, to uh, classes that they wouldn't be able to have. Um, you know, I can foresee, say, you know, if we bring back German, say, to Bloomington High School, the other high schools can have German because they can be involved in it. I mean, there's so much p potential for this to, to reach our students. So I'm really glad to see that we're uh, using the, the format. And, and I think it's going to be great for our students. And that's what matters. Um, I also want to thank 
Um, uh, Danielle Fernandez, uh, well, is assistant principal at Colton High School, and Kimberly Flynn, uh, who is a teacher at <clears throat> DRC Elementary. They are both the secondary and the elementary coordinators, uh, lead coordinators for Science Fair. Uh, we have a lot of coordinators, one at each site, but I really, and, and I thank them at the last meeting, but I want to thank the judges um, because, um, as you know, the Science Fair was originally going to be in person this year. And one week before we told Ms. Fernandez, okay, we got to go virtual. And um, uh, my husband and I were judges, and it was a little dicey. <laughs> Uh, because of the change and having to do it so uh, quickly make the change that normally uh, science fair we have anywhere from 25 to 30 judges and including my husband and myself we had six so <laughs> so it was uh, and technology wasn't being our friend that day um, and but it happened and I just want to thank everybody uh, th those two women and all of the other coordinators who were involved in putting it together at the last minute virtually because um, they did a, a lot of work in a very short amount of time. They weren't given much time to do it and I just really want to appreciate them for what they did for our students. I know that the parents whose kids were in the fair were really very grateful. I also want to bring up, um, you know, Unfortunately, sometimes things don't happen until some a tragedy happens or or something uh, bad happens. And as as we all know, we had a student, a uh, Colton High School student, who was a basketball player, and she was walking in the crosswalk um, um, from Colton High School across the street, and she was hit by a car. And uh, she's in a wheelchair. She's back in school now, and she was hit by a car. But uh, she has several injuries. And um, the girls on her team saw it happen, and they went and got her in the street, and they, lift, they all banded together, and they lifted her and carried her back to the classroom and because uh, their teacher was still there. And, and 911 was called and all of that. Um, these you know, there's a, there's a crosswalk there, but as we know, Rancho's a very busy street. And cars, especially when they're coming off that freeway and the light is green, they just fly right through there. And so this young lady was hurt quite badly. But these girls, um, they truly are uh, a team because they came together and they were upset about their teammate. And then they were upset because of what happened because people didn't stop. So they put together a petition to either put a stop sign there or the lights, the type of uh, crosswalk that has the lights at the bottom, a flashing stop sign, and they put a petition together. And then the teachers at Colton High School all started passing it around to parents and other teachers. And the thing mushroomed, and the girls took it last on Tuesday to the uh, city council for Colton. And um, they have a flashing stop sign coming to there. They have, are already working with public works to put it in. And I just, I just it's, it says a lot, like I said, it's, it takes a tragedy sometimes for things to get done. But I, I just wanna say, those girls are amazing. Congratulations to them for, for doing this. And, and getting this handled and getting it done so that other kids would be safe. So I just wanted to give a shout out to these wonderful girls who uh, saw a need and made it happen. And then my last uh, couple of things I wanted to bring up were um, uh, Lewis Elementary. Uh, I have, I got an email from a teacher and um, it's, in regards to, uh, he said that uh, his his students cannot see when he is teaching. They can't see uh, the projections, and they can't see. And he said, yeah, part of it is because of the, the shields. But he says, but we've gotten around that. He said because 
uh, what he did was something he wasn't supposed to do because we've been told not to do it by the fire marshals was uh, Lewis is a very, very old school and they have really big windows on the sides of their classrooms. And they were told to take down any papers and anything off the walls because by law we couldn't have them covering. It was a fire hazard. Well, he put them back up. He put black paper all the way across the windows and the kids were learning and doing their thing. And wouldn't you know, two weeks after he put it up, they had a fire inspection and he was told he needed to take them down immediately, which he did. Um, he did speak to his principal in regards to uh, the situation what happened because he figured if it was happening in his classroom, it's happening in other classrooms. And they said that a work order has been in because to tent those windows so this wouldn't happen. And it's been in for over a year. Now I know tinting windows isn't as important as some of the other things we've had to deal with in MNO this year, but it's important for these kids to be able to learn. So I told them that I would request that we look into the work order and please get these windows tinted so he doesn't have to do something illegal again. So that is Mr. Uh, so that is for Lewis Elementary. And the last thing I want to bring up, it's something that really, really bothered me. As a board member, we get a lot of things to read. Okay, we get stacks of stuff to read, whether it be by email or whatever. Some of the documents are quite large. But the one I have is the district LTAP report. And I believe that we as board members and we as a district, we are responsible, as board members, we're responsible to the people who put us in here and to the students that we serve and the staff that we serve. And it really, when I read through this, hurt my heart, because you know me, I'm a big crier. When I got to the satisfaction the summary results from our staff. Staff respond, responded that they were satisfied with their school leadership. They are not as content with district leadership. They felt only 37% of staff respondents indicated they are satisfied with the leadership at the district level. And 35% agree that district leadership communicates effectively with staff. Well, you know, if I look at that and I see that, I was like, you know, I remember like 100% was an A and 50% is a C. So 35%, what's that? That's failing. That means we're doing something wrong and it needs to be fixed. So I think we need to find whatever it is we need to do, but our district leadership, and it starts at the top and it starts with our assistant soups, that we need to find a way to better communicate to our staff because that this is an eye opener. This is wrong. We expect them to teach our students, but we aren't giving them what they need to teach. My quote this evening follows along with that. Leaders are responsible for creating an environment in which people feel they can be their best. 35% doesn't say we're doing the right thing to make them feel their best. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Harrell. Um, I would like to just um, make a comment, a couple of comments. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, Principal Joda Murphy 
as she's transitioning from her position that she has held at Colton High School for seven years to her new position as, as Director of Assessment and Accountability. Um, I want to acknowledge her successful tenure at Colton High School, not only at, ten, ten, at Colton High School, but she, her journey in our district has been, uh, she's been a principal at, at elementary level. She has a, been a principal at middle school, at our, you know, two of our middle schools. Um, and, and, and then her latest is a principal of um, Colton High School. And I just want to thank her uh, for everything she has done and also for all the young lives that she has touched during her tenure um, and, and during her journey in our district. So um, again, we wish, you, wish her luck in her new position. I know I'm, I'm excited to see what things she will come, she'll do in her new position. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is, again, I, I brought this up a few months ago um, about the shields. Um, we are, uh, are in the business of remo removing barriers that impede learning um you know it, that uh, impede students from learning i know there is a purpose for the shields i and um, um and uh, i'm all i'm asking is uh, um i'm not advocating again for the removal of them if, if if that is what we need to do but i do i would like you staff to re-evaluate and um you know and just review the purpose and and also um, because I, ours are clean um, but, you know, we've all been in schools and we see, you know, they're not as clean at, at the site level and sometimes they're scratched. And so um, I would just like to see if you can re revisit that, reevaluate the, you know, the need for them and come up with a plan maybe of, you know, in the future, you know, so that teachers have, have an understanding of where we're going with this and eventually be able to teach without them. So I would appreciate that. Okay, so um, with that, we are adjourning into. Yes, sure. I agree uh, that we need to look into it, but um, I think we need to make sure that uh, we talk to like our parent group because the, the shields when we bought them they were mandatory. Then they were not mandatory when we put them up, but we did because the parents asked for them, and I just want to make sure that. Well, I, I agree that we, you know, probably could take it down, because especially like Ms. Prachi said, I know ours are nice and clean, but the classrooms are getting kind of gnarly. <laughs> but, it, you know, I agree with that, but I just want to make sure that, um, that you know, our parents know, because since they were they were the ones who had asked for them to be put up. And I okay. don't want to. Yeah, we can add that, if, if that's okay. We'll, we'll add that, that piece to that. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Harlan. Okay, we are adjourning into closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. Thank you very much.
public employee. Uh, we have um, on a motion of board, by board member Fuentes and seconded by board member Sandoval, the board approved the following. Certificated regular staff, RSP mild moderate teacher, Colton High School, classified management, chief technology officer, district office, classified coach, coaches, uh, swimming assistant, track assistant, head varsity football, head junior varsity basketball boys, and head varsity cross country co-ed. Volunteer coaches, soccer and wrestling, track and softball girls. And one volunteer. Item 10.2. In closed session on a motion uh, of board member Ibarra and second by board member Haro and on a 7-0 vote, the board appointed John Abbott, principal of uh, high school at Colton High School. Okay. We are now adjourned. Okay.